Hallo. Servus. Marhaba. Hola. Hallo. I'm inspired that there's so many people working to accomplish the same goal of creating a connected future. By having students lead clubs on campus directly supported by Google developers, that's the best way to reach out to students. It's really inspirational always to hear about members of the community who echo your values and echo your beliefs. I've been listening more than I've been speaking and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because I'm just getting all these ideas. Google, it needs to reach a wider audience and be more relatable as a company and I think Google is one of the brands that is very good at doing that. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Fireside Chat brought to you by Google Developer Student Clubs. My name is Rahul Tapa and I'll be your host for tonight. I'm a senior computer science major and the president of Developer Student Club at Villanova University. Tonight, we have a really special guest with us, Alphabet Chairman and former president of Stanford, Dr. John Hennessy. But before we meet our special guests, I would like to take a few moments to introduce the Developer Student Clubs and what brought us, brought us here tonight. Developer Student Clubs are university-based community groups for students interested in Google developer technologies. These Developer Student Clubs aim to foster an inclusive community by welcoming any students interested in growing as a software developer. By joining a DSC, students grow their knowledge in a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment and build solutions for local businesses as well as their communities. Developer Student Clubs are truly global. Today, we have around 1,300 DSCs all around the world. And if this is your first time joining one of our events, I highly encourage you to check out dsc.community.dev to see all our upcoming events. Our event tonight is a testament to the global community we have. We have invited members from all around the world to participate, either by submitting their questions or joining us live right now. So now let me give you a little background on how this event started. Last year, Dr. Hennessy visited our university, Villanova University, and his alma mater. Everyone at Villanova were really excited to meet him, including myself. Uh, but unfortunately, I could not attend the event because the event was already booked and I was a little sad. Uh, but then this summer, I got an opportunity to read his book, uh, Leading Matters, Lessons from My Journey. And while reading the book, I felt a need to email Dr. Hennessy and tell him how much I enjoyed his book and how much it inspired me, especially in this difficult time. So I did. I emailed him thanking for giving us such a wonderful book uh, but also inviting him for a one-hour virtual event with our DSC chapter. But while discussing with my team, we realized why does this event have to be restricted to only our chapter? In fact, why does it even have to be restricted to Villanova or the US for that matter, right? We have this huge global network of DSC chapters and such an inspiring guest. So why not give students from all around the world an opportunity to participate in this event and get inspired, just like I did? No matter where you are from, if you want to ask questions to Dr. John Hennessy, just tweet out hashtag ask Dr. Hennessy along with your question and drop the question on the chat as well. And now for my main event, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Hennessy. Dr. John L. Hennessy is the James F. and Mary Lynn Gibbs Givens Professor of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at the Stanford School of Engineering. He's also the Sriram Family Director of Stanford's Knight Hennessy Scholars Program the largest fully endowed graduate level scholarship program in the whole world. He's also the chairman of Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Formerly the 10th president of Stanford University, he's also an entrepreneur who co-founded MIPS Computer Systems and Erythros Communications. His honors include 2012 Medal of Honor from the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and the 2017 ACM Turing Award. He's the author of my favorite book, Leading Matters, Lessons from My Journey. Thank you so much for joining tonight, Dr. Hennessy. Delighted to be here, Raul. Thank you. 
there's a lot to talk about at Hennessy. Uh, we got questions from students from all around the world, and um, we're going to be playing videos as well as uh, taking the questions on the chat as well. Uh, so once again, feel free to drop your questions in the chat, share the event across Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We are streaming all over. Everyone is welcome. Um, so Professor Hennessy, I really want to start from the beginning and start with this question by Francis Lau, a computer science major at Villanova University. And he asked, how early in your life did you know that you wanted to make technology your career? I think probably in high school. Um, my father was an engineer, actually, and so he had me constantly doing science things and building things. But in high school, we had a little computer club. In those days, a computer club meant you had a teletype machine, and we put our programs on paper tape, initially in BASIC. Later on, I did some Fortran. Um, but we didn't have the computer locally. It was remote, and you time-shared it somewhere. Uh, but that got me involved in computing. And then my, um, my science project in my senior year in high school uh, was to build a tic-tac-toe machine at a surplus relay. So I got, uh, I got excited about computing. And then I continued that at Villanova. And um, I've been in the field ever since, which has been a remarkable opportunity. Amazing. So you were at Villanova University as an electrical engineering uh, major, right? Um, no computer science undergraduates when I went to school. It was not yet yeah. a graduate major in the U.S. <laughs> would you have selected that over electrical engineer, I guess, if they had the option back then? Yeah, I probably would. I liked electrical engineering. I loved computing. I mean, it just even matched the way my brain worked even more. I see. Um, so in this next video, uh, we have a, um, a student, Eric. He wants to know a bit more about your college life. So let's take a look. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. My name is Eric Rocha. I'm a first-generation Mexican student studying at Elmhurst University. Um, I'm studying digital marketing and digital media. My question to you was, how were you as a student in high school and in college? You know, I, I was I was a so-so student until about high school, and then I had a math teacher who straightened me out and told me I had to work harder, and I got really focused. Um, I was a much better student in, in uh, college, and uh, as I went along, I really, because I loved computing, I really got into it in a, in a very uh, major way, and that really uh, was transformative for me. So my, my GPA went steadily uphill over time. <laughs> got it. Oh, what kind of computing classes did you take when you were at Villanova? Or did you take any computing classes at all? Uh, yeah, there was a, an introductory programming course for all engineers. So mm -hmm. I took that. And then I then I worked for a while in the computer center helping students who were doing their own development, their own uh, their own coding. Uh, and then when as I decided eventually that I was going to go pursue a PhD in computer science, mm -hmm. uh, I had to go take a bunch of math courses because... Uh, the, the finite math underlying computer science is a little different than the kind of math you learn in double E's, which is largely a calculus, analytical, differential equations. So um, I had to jump over and take a bunch of math courses at that time uh, I see. before I headed off to my PhD. I see. Um, so we have one more question regarding your time at um, like uh, college, Villanova University. Uh, our vice president, CU, wants to know what is one most memorable moment that you have in your uh, college career at Villanova University? You know, I think probably the thing that really made a difference in my life was uh, a, a professor, Professor Stephen Ching, who gave me the opportunity to work on some undergraduate research mm. uh, project. And that really got me excited about research and pursuing a PhD because pursu pursuing a PhD, you really have to be self-driven and excited about your research or you're never going to be able to complete it. It's it's extremely demanding and intensive. And that was a great opportunity for me. Yeah. Do you remember uh, what you researched on at all? Or... Uh, yeah. So it was a, it, it was a special uh, way to build a hardware. Um, and he was building a, he was building a machine to, uh, that could emulate different machines. And he gave me the opportunity to work on it for a while. It was a terrific opportunity. Got it. Um, we also got a lot of questions um, with the young, like student entrepreneurs. And one of the students asked, how important is taking risk in life? And should I be taking risk from very early on in my career? I think it's important to take risks when you really believe what you're doing. So you have to be willing to stretch yourself and to take new opportunities. I think, uh, you know, for me, starting a company, I was a lifelong academic. I was very happy being an academic. Starting a company was a completely different experience and one that I did only because I became convinced 
that the technology we had was really gonna change the world and change the way computers work. Um, so it's important to take those risks, but calculated risk that you think if this works, I really could do something really great and make a big dent. Hi, Dr. Hennessy and everyone out there. Uh, looks like Rahul just encountered some technical issues. Uh, so I'll be hosting us temporarily while he tries to get back in. Okay. Um, yeah, so we have a question from Tejas, who's our technical lead, and we'll play that now. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. Thank you for speaking with us today. I'm an international student Villanova coming from France. I'm working on a startup with a partner, and I wanted to ask you, based on your vast experience, what is the biggest advice you would give us in order to create a viable business out of our startup? Thank you. Well, it's a great question coming all the way from Paris, too. Uh, so uh, I think the most important thing for startups, the, the thing I always, when I'm working with students who are thinking about startups is to say, really focus on what your technology is. What do you have that really is competitive, can really make a difference, and, is, and will be a protectable advantage for you? It's hard to do a startup. It's really hard to succeed. Having something that's really, um, significantly better than what exists out there is absolutely crucial to make it successful. Gotcha. And uh, do you have any advice for better understanding when it's time to go all in uh, and, and stop working on whatever other projects you have you know, on the back burner, things like that? Yeah, I think, I think the key thing is, A, A, do you really believe in the technology? Do you believe it's really uh, going to be, or, or, or it, can be a, it can be a business model innovation as well, right? I mean, we have companies that are eBay or Amazon. They started as business model innovations rather than core uh, technology innovations. They didn't require us to advance the technology, at least initially. Um, what do you have that you really have a value proposition? Focus, focus, focus. If you think about Amazon today, you can buy anything at Amazon, but it started selling books, books and CDs because books and CDs were something that people didn't need to try on or get their hands on before they bought them. So having a model that enables you to build and scale over time is absolutely crucial. And looks like Rahul's back. Welcome Rahul. Thank you so much. Sorry for that. Uh, it must have been my network connection. Um, so um, the next question we have is, when we go about executing an idea, uh, how do we know whether to go, uh, it'll be successful? And as a college student who has so many commitment, devoting time to a single idea can be very difficult. So how do we know when to go all in? It's really hard to tell. Sometimes, particularly if it's, a, if it's, if it's something that's focused on the consumer space, it's really hard to tell what will work and what work won't work. E even those of us who've been in the industry for a while can't always tell whether something is going to go viral and catch a lot of attention or not. Um, but you can do experiments. You can try something else. One thing I've been a great uh, fan of is students saying, look, I'm going to take this summer. I'm going to try to get this idea to some shape and then try to build a user community often with other students, often not and not distributing it beyond the bounds of the university, but get the university community to start using it as a way to see whether or not uh, you might get traction. Indeed, that's how Facebook began, right? Began at Harvard uh, and you're just getting connections between Harvard, Harvard students, uh, and then, and then uh, students at, at other universities and then larger and larger and larger. So that, that's a good scaling method. You get to try it out first. Um, yeah, so I was just saying, I hope it really helps all the college entrepreneurs who asked uh, these questions. Uh, but now I want to digress and go into your um, journey into PhD. So after graduating from Villanova, you joined Stony Brook University in New York for your PhD in computer science. So one student asked, at what point in your undergraduate career did you know that you wanted to pursue a PhD? And is there any particular event that triggered it? 
I kind of decided during my junior year, I think the final, the final, I, I really, I loved opportunities to work with students and help them learn computing early on, which I did a lot of when I was at Villanova. Uh, and then I, the other, the key trigger point was that undergraduate research experience. That really got me uh, convinced. And so I made the decision in my junior year that I was gonna go do that um, and started to really reorient my, um, my studies, particularly in my senior year, late my junior year and my senior year to prepare for a PhD. Got it. And what made you, made you choose Stony Brook over all the universities? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. So uh, my uh, I met the woman who's been my wife for 45 years, 47 years, um, when I was when we were both seniors in high school. But we ended up going to college hundreds of miles apart because uh, we had already made our decisions. I came to Villanova. Uh, she went to the Potsdam, which is 40 miles from the Canadian border, uh, far north New York. Um, so we, uh, we kept our relationship uh, going and we decided to get married and uh, she was going to do her student teaching in New York. So I really wanted to be somewhere in New York. And um, I finished my undergraduate degree in three and a half years. Uh, and Stony Brook would take me in the middle of the year and would give me financial aid. So that was key because we didn't have a lot of money otherwise and we wanted to get married. So all those things uh, came together uh, at Stony Brook. Uh, so I do have one question. Um, so how has Mary's influenced you or shaped you as a person and influenced your life goal? Uh, would you mind saying that a little bit? Oh, sure. It's definitely influenced my, my life goal. My wife and I are in two completely different things. She comes from an artistic background. Um, and But she has educated me about the arts over time and uh, the importance of that. And um, she's been a, a great partner for me, uh, especially during the years it, it, while I was president, I, I, you become a public persona. Uh, and she was my partner through many years, uh, entertaining and hosting many, many events uh, during the time that I was in the presidency for 16 years. By the way, what is your favorite art that your wife might have introduced you to? Oh, I think she introduced me to a lot of different artists, but a lot of the impressionist artists and a lot of the Renaissance artists. So I, those are probably my favorite, my favorite art forms. Got it. Um, so after you finished your PhD, uh, you started working as an assistant professor at Stanford University, and you also started your research on reduced instruction state computer, um, short form for RISC. Can you please explain the RISC technology to anyone who may not know uh, right now joining us? Uh, yeah, the simplest way to think about this is um, th think about two different kinds of books. One written with really big words that you don't know that every time you're reading it, you've got to go look up the word in the dictionary. It's a slow reading process when people write and cumbersome sentences that are hard to understand. So that's one way to write a piece of computer code. And it's not only hard for you to understand, it's hard for the computer to execute and interpret quickly. What RISC says is we're going to use simpler words and simpler sentence structures that are easier, easier for me to read, easier for the computer to understand. And because it's easier for the computer to understand, it can actually execute faster on that. And it turns out the key insight is that the number of extra words I need is not many more. And so because I can do them much faster and I just need a small number of extra words, I can actually execute my programs faster. So it makes more efficient use of the computer hardware, which is really uh, crucial. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it revolutionized the computer industry, you know, and uh, you, in 1984, you co-founded a company called MIPS based on uh, commercializing the product of your research. And you transitioned from being a faculty member to an entrepreneur, right? Um, so in this next video, a student expresses an interest in that transition. So let's take a look. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. My name is Min. I'm, a current I'm a currently a junior at Villanova, majoring in finance. And my question to you is this, what made you transition from a professor at Stanford to starting your own company? And what factors did you consider and take into account when making that very important decision? Thank you. That's a good question. I, um, I, uh, initially, I, I, we published our papers and we thought these ideas are so good that the industry will just pick them up. But that's not what happened. In fact, in fact, there were two industry projects that were kind of building on our work as well as the work that went on at Berkeley. 
and they both ended up being canceled. So we realized, you know, this technology simply was too disruptive to the existing products and they were too worried about obsoleting their own products with this new technology. So I became convinced with, with a, a, a senior colleague who um, pushed me uh, that, I, that we needed to start a company to do it. So I got together with um, a guy who had left IBM uh, under the same circumstances, who was disappointed that they didn't pursue the technology, and somebody who had worked at Motorola, and we decided uh, we go out and start a we go out and start a company. Um, I took a leave from the university, so I could go back to the university, um, but I I um, and I was gone on a full time basis for about eighteen months, getting the company uh, set up. Um, but I decided in the end that my uh, my heart was really at the university and working with students. So I had an ongoing part time relationship with the company, but I came back and put most of my focus at the university. Got it. Um, and one of the big things that happened, um, I mean, MIPS was such a success and uh, you did an awesome job there. But during your time at MIPS, you had to lay off like one third of the employees and it must have been really tough decision that you have to make. Um, and in your book, you talk about, um, in the leading matters, you talk about uh, courage, which compels a leader to take the right action. So in the hindsight, do you think that was the right decision? And could you have done anything differently? Well, what I could have done differently is we could have not hired all those people to begin with. So <laughs> we just grew too fast. And the CEO, in an attempt to prove that the company was going to be successful and he knew what he was doing, just recruited too many people. And I was a, I was a, just a young engineer. I mean, at, at that point, I was 32 years old. I didn't really know, didn't have the experience to say, well, we're growing too fast. Um, so that's what I would have avoided. In the past, I, you know, to do it again, I wouldn't have hired uh, all those people because hiring and them, laying them off is a real morale crusher yeah. for the people in the company. Uh, that we didn't have a choice, though. It was do that. In fact, you know, the CEO asked me to get up and give an inspiring talk after we gave the layoffs to tell everybody this company was going to be successful and was still a great company. Um, so, and it was, and it, it it turned out okay, but it was a painful a painful process. Yeah. Um, so, following up on that question, um, another important quality of a leader that you talk about is empathy. Uh, so. Empathy, like how did you empathize with all those at MIPS uh, who lost their job? And it is especially relevant today because a lot of people are losing their job because of COVID-19 pandemic, right? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. I mean, you know, because a small company, we had about 100 people and maybe 120. And it means that you knew the people who were getting losing their jobs. Um, you know, the economy wasn't in the, in the dumps as it is now. So there wasn't like there weren't other opportunities out there, but it was... It was hard to do. In the end, you know, I realized that if we didn't do this, the whole company was going to collapse. Um, I mean, we were within we were in within two weeks of running out of money, so it was not, it was a desperate situation in that sense. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. Uh, one of the um, famous quote that you made, once made: um, "You ha you have to go through a dark time. Uh, the faster you act, the better." Uh, and I really really like that quote. So how have you lived up to that code during the dark time? And do you have any suggestion to people um, right now? Because COVID-19 certainly is a really troubling time for everyone. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in the, in, in the other crises I've encountered, I've just used that lesson I learned early on at, at, at MIPS so that, you know, when we went through the 2008, 2009 financial crisis and I was the president of the university, we decided, we were going to have to do layoffs. The, we lost uh, about a third of our endowment, um, which meant we, lo we lost about a 10% of our overall budget. There's no way we could survive that without doing some layoffs. But let's get them done quickly, as humanely as possible, so that people had an opportunity to move on and find other, other employment opportunities. Um, but then let's get, let's get through that so we can start rebuilding and thinking about where we want to go, where we want to go next. It's a little harder with COVID-19 because we really don't know when we'll be able to resume. There's a lot of uncertainty. And I think that's one of the things that makes this particular uh, process bad. But I'm a, I'm a great believer. You get all the data out, you get the facts out, and then you make smart decisions. I, I wish our country had made some better decisions than we have made because the fact that we're the, we're the best medical care in the country and we have a not very good record. 
on COVID-19 because we didn't react properly. We didn't listen to the scientists and that's a mistake. Yeah, most certainly it is. Um, so we have one more entrepreneurial question. Uh, so this, uh, the, the, the one at MIPS, it was your first like kind of um, entrepreneurial experience and you're pretty new to the field. Uh, so in this next video, a student is curious about this early phase in, in, in an entrepreneurial journey. So let's take a look. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. Um, my name is Owen O'Leary Fitzpatrick. Uh, I'm from the University, uh, the National University of Ireland in Galway, uh, Ireland, uh, studying business information systems. Um, my question for you is, what would be the biggest mistake that a young entrepreneur uh, would make in their early career and conversely what would be the best thing that a entrepreneur could do uh, for their for starting off uh, thank you so much for taking the time to answer my question all the best bye bye from my from my you know my ancestors are all Irish they were all are Irish immigrants into the United States so uh, it's great to have a question from Ireland so I, I think the biggest mistake, uh, that you make is not realizing the importance of having a really well-rounded team. You know, when we started MIPS, it was three engineers. We didn't really understand anything about business. Would have been better if we had somebody in the founding team that understood a little more about business. I mean, we didn't understand anything. I couldn't read a balance sheet, for example, at that point. Um, and we didn't understand a lot of fundamental things. That, that hurt us early on. We hired people to do that, but not having that core insight from the beginning uh, really hurt us. I think the most important thing we did was we hired really outstanding people. And the advice, I, the biggest thing you can do to make the thing successful is to get great people. You start with a great idea, a great insight, then you hire the very best people you can. And that makes a really big difference, particularly when you have to go through those crises. To have really good people who can work, who can really deliver for you, uh, is really important. Got it. Um, so I want to now transition to your uh, time at Stanford and subsequently at um, Alphabet, Chairman of Alphabet. So you had an amazing 16 year as the president of the Stanford. Um, then you transitioned into the role of uh, being Chairman of Alphabet in 2018. So related to these two roles, a student from South Africa has a question uh, for you in this next video. Hi, Dr. Hennessy. Thank you for giving us the time to pick your brain. I'd like to know which experiences as the president of Stanford has made the most substantial impact in your day-to-day -day life as the chairman of Alphabet. Thank you very much. Well, I think there are two things I learned from my uh, time at the university that have been valuable at, at, at Alphabet. Um, the first is, you know, universities are places where we're constantly trying to innovate and be at the cutting edge. Um, and so, so a bunch, and that's certainly true also at Alphabet. We're really trying to innovate constantly, think about new businesses, new technologies. So there was a lot I learned from the university uh, that I could bring over and bringing both some technology insight, but also some insight on how to organize and uh, create an ecosystem that can continue to be inventive and can create new products. Um, you know, Eric Schmidt, who was the, the CEO of uh, Google for many years and then the chairman of Alphabet before me, um, once said, um, you know, we try to run Alphabet or Google like a really great university like Stanford, to really create this, this system that can, that can innovate constantly. Um, the other thing I the other thing I learned is you know universities have prided themselves on having uh, very diverse communities inside them both at the faculty and the student level, and obviously that's be that's become in the last decade or so a bigger and bigger issue for Silicon Valley and tech companies. So some of my experience in how we do this at the university and we make an environment that allows people from very diverse backgrounds to flourish and and really make important commitments. I brought some of that on insight over as we've talked about how we make uh, Silicon Valley and, and the tech industry more diverse um, going forward. Um, so when we are on the topic of the alphabet, um, we have a question regarding what emerging technology are you most interested in and how would you want to see that technology integrated by alphabet and its subsidiaries? 
Well, certainly I, I am a big believer in the AI revolution. And I, uh, I still remember the board meeting where um, uh, one of the senior vice presidents came in and talked about sh shifting a Google strategy, shifting Google strategy. <laughs> oh, okay, be quiet. <laughs> Uh, it'll go off in a second. Shifting Google's strategy uh, to focus on AI as the core technology and the mainstay of what the company uh, was doing. So I um, I jumped on that bandwagon very quickly, and I'm still excited about it. I mean, the AI revolution is real. It's making a big difference. We're, we're on a weekly basis. Uh, we're demonstrating capabilities which we couldn't have done 10 years ago. So that's a that's something I'm really excited about. I'm excited about uh, some next generation uh, mobile technologies and some next generation cybersecurity technologies where I think um, cybersecurity is becoming an increasingly big problem. Uh, and uh, we're piling some new technologies that will really uh, improve that. I think um, COVID's also forced us to think about, you know, how do we create a better virtual way to interact so people can interact better online and make that better. And I think it's going to lead to uh, the creation of some new technologies uh, that push us even further down the stream of trying to create more realistic, more, more virtual reality kind of uh, opportunities to do work online. Definitely. And me, myself, I'm a great enthusiast of AI. Um, and in fact, Professor Andrew Yang, uh, which I highly admire, he calls AI is the new electricity. Uh, so can you please tell us some AI technology in the past for five years that has really impressed you? Well, certainly the, the victory of AlphaGo over the world's Go champion, that was the, if, if you look at a Delta turning point, that was the key turning point. It came, it came probably 10 to 20 years earlier than I think uh, most AI researchers even believed it was going to happen. Um, deep learning is the real basis of that breakthrough. Um, and it's the thing that's really the, the big driver here. I think if you look at what's happened recently, you know, there's an interesting way of looking at this. You can think of deep learning as programming with data, especially with respect to supervised learning. It's programming with data rather than with code. And you look at the uh, Google natural language system, BERT, and, you know, that's a system that had a half a million lines of code to do, uh, to do natural language recognition on phase, um, phrase based methods. And then it was converted to an AI-based deep learning system um, with a reduction of code of about 100 to 1 in terms of the amount of code and better results. So that's a real sign of what we can do with this. It doesn't solve all problems. Uh, everything depends on the data. It is supervised learning. So if you don't train it well, it's not going to do what you want. But if you train it well, it does remarkable things. And what is your view on unsupervised learning? Um, do you think that'll make a lot of difference? Yeah, unsupervised learning has a has a role to play, particularly for discovery kinds of problems where we're looking for patterns and insights um, rather than uh, supervised learning. I'm also excited about some of the other new models uh, coming along, uh, GANs, for example, different kinds of ways to combine uh, and to use multiple uh, multiple systems to compete against one another and train one another uh, as next generation um, uh, deep learning systems. Um, so another new technology that really interests me, uh, because I come from physics background, I started my college as a physics major, and quantum computing, uh, you know, there's a big buzzword uh, right now, and a lot of people asked uh, about that question as well. So in this next video, uh, a student from Cairo wants to ask you on that topic. Let's take a look. Hello, Dr. Hensi. I would like to ask about how could cloud-based quantum computing affect our lives after many years from now? And my second question is, how Alphabet as a company prepares for this transformation? Thank you so much. Well, yeah, good questions. I mean, I think quantum computing is still very much in its, um, in its infancy, right? It's very much still uh, people who are physicists are really clustered around it. Um, uh, computer scientists are working on complementary uh, problems, quantum algorithms, uh, quantum error correction. Quantum error correction is a really big critical area because if, if we don't get
get a breakthrough in that area, we'll never get uh, large scale quantum computers. And we have a long ways to go to get to a scale uh, that's really uh, useful. If we could get to that scale, um, it, which probably means thousands of qubits versus the hundred or so that we're currently at, um, then, then uh, there are some important quantum algorithms that work, uh, that work really well, particularly factorization. Uh, that will change our whole way in which we do cryptography. We'll have to move to a different uh, crypto-based system and away from the current RSA system that relies on how hard factoring is. Uh, that's not, that's not going to happen tomorrow, but it could happen as early as 10 years from now, possibly, uh, possibly longer. Um, other big problems that quantum can do, you know, because quantum systems can simulate the real world, the quantum nature of chemistry, and um, we can do things that today are intractable. Um, yeah. determine how a protein falls from first principles, for example. It's computationally extremely difficult uh, to do. Um, however, to do that problem, we need a much bigger quantum computer, much, much bigger, because the molecules we were really interested in uh, have thousands or tens of thousands of atoms in them. They're not small molecules. So that's going to be a real, that's going to take so some time. Um, how is Google preparing? Well, Google has a, is, is sponsoring a bunch of quantum research and has a quantum research group. And so that gives us a, I like to think of those kinds of things as, um, you know, you have a, you have a crow's nest. You're, you're doing that kind of work so that you can see exactly how this technology might play out and when it might have a big role to play. And as a, as a major player in the tech industry, uh, Google should absolutely be doing that kind of thing. Definitely. Uh, if you have to give a wild guess, how long do you think it'll take for us to have a personal qu quantum computer? Uh, I, I, I don't think you're ever going to have a personal quantum computer because I don't think you're ever going to want to, um, you're going to want to have the refrigeration unit that's associated with that quantum computer in your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that would be. As the questionnaire, as the questioner asks, the data center is a much more likely place for that quantum computer to reside. Got it. So it'll be used more for like high intensity work and um, yeah. like research work mostly. Okay. Uh, for this next one, we have a video question from a student at Villanova University who wants to know a little bit more about your role at Alphabet. So let's take a look. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. I am Van To from Villanova University in the United States, and I'm studying finance and management information system. And I have a question for you today is that how has Google and Alphabet evolved in terms of its core value after you joined? Thank you for answering. Well, I think I think you know, um, like uh, like any company, since I joined Google, it's grown by uh, an enormous amount. When I joined, it was still a relatively small company, a few thousand employees. Today, there are over a hundred thousand employees, uh, and it's worldwide. At that time, it it was primarily still just in Mountain View, um, and uh, had we didn't have a browser product yet. Chrome didn't exist. Uh, Android didn't exist. Um, so the company has grown and diversified uh, over time, and we've tried to think about what, where are the new opportunities? Where can Google build products that uh, really would make a difference in people's lives and make their lives better? So we constantly uh, try to think about that. Um, we hadn't bought YouTube yet. YouTube was an acquisition that occurred after I uh, joined the board of, uh, of Google. So we've constantly thought about things that fit well. Uh, and where we can deliver greater value to users. Got it. Um, so I want to digress and move to this uh, new topic, um, your newest venture. Uh, in 2016, you started a global scholarship program called Night Hennessy Scholar Program, uh, which provides scholarship to really talented people from all around the world uh, to attend Stanford University for the graduate education. Uh, and it is personally my favorite topic to talk about. So in this next video, uh, an aspiring student has a question for you regarding that. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. My name is Anand Ney. I'm a junior majoring in computer science at Arizona State University. And my question to you is, what are a few traits you see in new hires and Stanford Knight Hennessy scholars? Thank you. 
So what, what, what do we look for in scholars? We look for people who are academically very talented because they are all enrolled in graduate programs at Stanford. So they have to uh, be successful in those, in those programs, whether it's a PhD or, or an MBA or a JD or whatever the program MD. Um, and, but we're also looking for people that have demonstrated evidence of their, um, their leadership abilities and their emerging ability as a leader. Um, they don't yet have to solve a major world problem. Uh, we hope they do that 20 years after they graduate from us. But we're looking for people who are committed to uh, that kind of leadership role and who see themselves um, doing good for others in, in their work. Um, so that's the kind of people we're, we're looking for. Got it. Um, and it has been four years. Uh, so you have um, four different cohorts. Has any of them graduated yet? Uh, I don't think so. Right? Yeah, we actually have three cohorts. We just, we okay. just, admissions for the fourth cohort just closed today at 1 p.m. So, yeah, we're just beginning our admissions process for our fourth cohort. Um, we have graduated about a handful, a handful of people who are in uh, two year programs have graduated, uh, probably four or five. Got it. Uh, so it might be too early to ask, like, what kind of impact they have created in the world. But will you be willing to share some kind of inspiring story, some kind of uh, hints that you have might have got, or some some project that the students might have worked on that is in the Nightness Court? You know. Yeah. Well, we had one one of our scholars has started a new nonprofit um, uh, called the Card Bank, and the goal of this nonprofit, there are billions of dollars of gift cards in the world that are unused that are just sitting in people's drawers, not being used. So he had an interesting idea in the, in the middle of the COVID crisis where a lot of people have lost their jobs and where uh, they might be food insecure or have other challenges. Um, suppose that people were willing to donate these cards. Could you actually make a bank, uh, give them out and, and help out people? Um, Particularly in, in many parts of the country, uh, food banks have actually run out of food. They haven't been able to meet the demand that's been created by the unemployment caused by uh, COVID. So he's built a little nonprofit for doing this. Uh, you can do it all online. It turns out the cards can be uh, translated digitally um, and that way um, get them to people who can really use them. Um, but that's an example of one of, the, one of the new things that one of our scholars has done. No, I think that's an amazing idea. Um, I personally have a few uh, gift card laying around that I haven't used. Uh, so that's an amazing idea. Um, so one last question related to the Night Hennessy Scholar Program. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that one of the students from my home country, Nepal, also has expressed interest in the program. So let's take a look at the video. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. I'm Shitis Bora, a mechanical engineering graduate from Tribune University, Nepal. My question for you is, how is being the chairman of a company different than being the president of a university? And also, how is it different than being a director of a global scholarship program? Thank you. Well, they're all different. I mean, I think um, they, they're all different roles and with different responsibilities. Um, I, I think most of my life has been dedicated to educating young people. Um, and that's where my role as president of the university um, is similar to my role as head of the Knight Hennessy Scholars. Of course, um, being the, the chair of Alphabet is a yet another kind of role, um, also focused on innovation and leadership. Um, so I think I've, I've really tried to emphasize those things in everything I do. Um, you know, I'm a person who's optimistic about the future, um, but I'm also a person who's constantly thinking about how we can innovate and do things differently. And that's true in Knight Hennessy. It was true when I was leading Stanford, and it's certainly true at Alphabet. Got it. Um, so you touched upon this a little bit in, um, before. Uh, so what do you think is the right face of leadership um, in this COVID-19 pandemic? And in other words, what advice do you have for leaders as they try to do what's best for their team uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, listen to the scientists. Um, uh, you know, if Dr. Fauci says something, I'm, I'm aligned with what he says. So listen to the scientists. Um, let's think about wearing a mask isn't only about your health, it's protecting the health of your fellow, your neighbors and your community. So I think those are things we could do. Then let's figure out how we can get the things restarted. And then the most important thing probably is 
let's make sure we don't let this happen again and find ourselves so unprepared for dealing with it. You know, I, I was struck, uh, Raul, by a talk that Bill Gates gave almost a decade ago, where uh, a TED talk where somebody asked him what the biggest danger facing the world is. And he said, a global pandemic, that's what will kill a million people. Well, we demonstrated that we didn't listen. Let's not make that mistake again. Let's listen and be prepared for this and think about it as a world community, realizing that you can't separate parts of the world anymore. We're so intertangled. We need to think about these things collaboratively. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and when we're talking about Bill Gates, you know, um, Bill Gates, as well as Warren Buffett, has mentioned the importance of reading, right? They, they themselves are, are a voracious reader, and you are also a very vigorous reader. So why do you think it is so critical for a leader to uh, read, you know? And when did you get started? Well, I started when I was very young. I started, I was a voracious reader early on. It's something my parents uh, encouraged and instilled. My mother really instilled a love of reading in me, and I've had it my entire life. So my view um, is that there are a couple different ways of learning in, in your life. You can try to have every possible experience, um, but the time for experiences is limited. Um, so I like to learn by reading what, how other people have dealt with crises. Um, you know, how did Lincoln get us through the Civil War? Um, how did we combat the 1918 uh, pandemic crisis? What worked, what didn't work? In fact, there are lessons directly from the 1918 pandemic that we haven't listened to. Um, San Francisco, for example, is a city that uh, closed down and then reopened too soon and had a second wave. Um, there are cities in the United States that didn't close down and that had enormous death rate, rates uh, because of that in the 1918 pandemic. So if people would read a little more and understand uh, the historical perspective, um, I think it would be quite important. Um, so now we want to take some questions from the YouTube chat. So um, a student from San Jose State University studying computer science, and he asked, what would be some of the biggest pieces of advice for being a good lead student leader? Well, I think of being a good student leader, being a good leader always involves being a good listener and listening to, um, to your fellow uh, community members. And particularly when you're a student leader, it's critical to listen to the, the fellow students. The other, thing, the other thing I think that's absolutely crucial is, you know, what a, what a university uh, administrator wants to hear from a student leader is they want that student leader to collect the opinions of the students and refine it so that they can say, here are the top three things that the student community really cares about. Not, not 50 things, here are the top three things. Now that's hard to do as a leader because you've got to listen, you've got to, and you've got to draw priorities. That's the hard part of being a leader is to getting those priorities. But that's much more useful information to a university administrator than a list of 50 things. Um, list of 50 things is too many. You're not going to get them done. So getting that, getting that prioritization is hard, but important. And um, next question we have from Aditya Dixit, a CS and econ major from the University of San Francisco. And uh, the question is, what do you think the pandemic has done to transform higher education and the role of online learning? Well, I think it certainly pushed online learning. And I think it's shown us... Um, cases where online learning is probably about as good as being in person. But it's also shown us that online is not a replacement for in person. Uh, there have been a bunch of pundits that have written, oh, now online is going to take off and people aren't going to go to a physical university anymore. And be you know who hates this pandemic the most in the university? The students are the ones that hate it the most. They hate being separated and not having these working sessions and being able to get together and discuss things and talk about a lecture or do a problem set together. So I think we can find ways to use online learning that are really important. And large class, large lectures are not a great learning environment anyway. And I think you can do those as well online. But those small intimate gatherings of students and faculty members, and that's that really needs to be done in person. Yeah, and I can totally relate to that. Uh, I'm at home right now taking my online classes and staring at my wall all the time and my computer all the time. It is not the best experience. Oh, no, you get zoomed out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I cannot really focus that much. So I can totally relate with that. 
Um, for this next question, we have Alvin um, from the University of Toronto. And his question is, I've been seeing news from GPT GPT-3 in recent months. Do you think most programming jobs will be obsolete? Soon the AI will rise. Uh, no, I think programming jobs are going to change. I mean, the uh, AI is like other revolutions we've had, right? When we've had the industrial revolution, we've had other ones. This will be, and the, and the information technology revolution. Information technology revolution, yeah, some jobs got captured by information technology, but lots of other jobs got created. I think the same thing's going to happen to AI with AI. The challenge for, for everybody out there is going to be to raise your skill level to understand this to new technology, to learn how to use it and begin, uh, begin deploying it. Um, and it's going to happen quickly, I think. So it's going to, it's going to require us to retrain and retool ourselves uh, quickly. Definitely. And um, you have also mentioned in the past that it'll change the type of job we have, but not necessarily take the job because more people might be learning how to use the technology and, and uh, working that way. Right. Yep. Um, so, for this next question, um, you stress a lot on, on the importance of mentors. Um, even an IDNC scholar program have like multiple mentorship uh, programs. So in the past, you also have yourself mentioned that many mentors helped you along the way uh, of your journey. So in this next video, a student is interested in learning more about your mentors. So let's take a look. Hello, Dr. Hennessy. I'm Orly from Beijing International Studies University in China, studying Hebrew. And my question is, which different mentors have influenced you the most in different phases of your life? You know, I think as I went through different stages, I had a different mentors. Um, uh, Professor Ching at, at, at Villanova, who originally mentored me. My, I had two PhD advisors at Stony Brook who were um, mentored me, taught me how to write a good scientific paper, how to present well, uh, how to be a better teacher. Um, and then when I was a young faculty member, I had a senior colleague um, who mentored me on how to write research programs, how to write uh, competitive research papers, how to develop a research group. Uh, and then as I became an administrator, uh, the people who were above me in the administrative chain, uh, my dean, for example, or the president of the university later on when I was dean and provost, um, helped me learn how to do that job better. And um, I could ask them questions about why did you make that decision or how did you think about that? Or they'd give me valuable nuggets. One of the most valuable pieces of advice I got was from the Dean of Engineering, um, who the, out, the outgoing Dean, because they had asked me if I would take the job. And he told me, um, take this job because you want to serve the students and the faculty members. Um, in the School of Engineering. Don't take it because you like the title or the fancy office or anything else. Take it because you want to serve those people. And that was a, that was a great lesson. And I, I learned it and I've, I've told many people that ever since. Definitely. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, so as a mentee, I'm also interested in knowing how should I go about choosing a mentor? Can you uh, speak on that as well? Yeah, I think the key thing, I'm a great believer that it's up to the mentee to be the agenda setter and the selector. So you need to pick the person who you think will be a good mentor. Yeah, you can, uh, there can be a little matchmaking that goes on there to find the right relationship or to, but it really is up to you to pick the person who you think uh, you can get the best advice from. And then you drive the agenda. When you're meeting with your mentor, you come in with the questions. It's not your mentor's job to quiz you. It's your job to kind of say, you know, here's, here's the question I have. I'm thinking about this path versus this path. What, what do you think about that? Or I'm, uh, I'm thinking about uh, graduate school and how do I, should I think about graduate school? Is it something I should go do full time right away? Is it something I do part time? Those are all good things to, that you can ask somebody who's got some experience. Um, in the academy or in the industry about. Note it down. And it's especially relevant to me because I'm looking into uh, going into PhD program and I'm looking for all the research advisors. So thank you so much for saying that. Um, so your journey has been truly amazing with many great achievements. Um, so in this next video, a student from India has a question regarding uh, this successful journey. So let's take a look. Hey, Dr. Hennessy. I'm Aman Gupta from UPES India, studying Bachelor's of Technology in Computer Science Engineering. I would like to ask, how has your definition of success changed over time? Thank you very much. 
<laughs> uh, that's a very good question because my definition of success has changed a lot over time. You know, when you're a when you're a young student, your success is very much tied into how you're doing your courses, or later on when you become a PhD student, how your research is going. Um, and when you're a faculty member, um, your research, how, how's your teaching going? How's your research going? You know, do the students really appreciate the course? Do they give you good ratings at the end of the course? Uh, did they appreciate, did they really learn the material? Um, you know, you're, you're a young faculty member, you're doing research, you write a research paper, you want your colleagues to really think it's a great paper. And um, so you're very much, there's a lot of individualized feedback. Uh, when you move into a higher level leadership job, your job really is making other people successful. Um, it's making, you know, students and faculty in the School of Engineering successful or undergraduates at Stanford successful or faculty members successful. Even today, my job, my job is primarily making the Knight Hennessy Scholars successful. So my definition of success now is tied to what they do and what they achieve. Um, but I, I've discovered that I enjoy that and I, and I get great uh, rewards from seeing one of our scholars do start a new nonprofit, write a great paper, do something, make a great discovery. Um, and that's something that's important to understand. If you want to be a leader, you have to, you have to feel the success of others um, is something that, that rewards you personally. Definitely. And I, I can say that your definition of success has been truly amazing. It's just seeing the uh, the quote of Knight Hennessy Scholar, you know, because I go through the website, check out uh, what they have done and their profile. There are some truly amazing candidates there. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have arrived almost to the end of our event. Um, I took this uh, last question as a question that I wanted to ask you for, for a year now. I wanted to ask you last year, but I could not. Um, so in 2005, uh, Steve Jobs gave a famous commencement speech at Stanford, and you were the uh, president at that time. And one of the main theme of the talk was uh, connecting the dots, uh, where he talked about how various influences and his life uh, shaped his journey. And you, you, you talk a bit about um, Steve Jobs in your book as well, and you admire him as well. Um, so this idea of connecting dot is, in fact, the part of the uh, Night and Scholar program uh, essay as well that um, I personally have to write. Uh, but now I want to turn the table and ask you the same question. Uh, so Dr. Hennessy, so within an hour, we have touched up on various phases of your life. Will you please connect the dots for us? Yeah, the dots in my life connect in a really unusual and interesting way. You know, my my uh, mother was a school teacher and my father was an engineer and my father instilled a love of science and, and discovery in me and my mother instilled a love of reading. And that's something that stuck with me uh, for my entire entire life. I've tried to, the, the pieces of my life, I've tried to learn from every stage I've gone through, which gave me the opportunity then to be better prepared for the next, the next stage. And I got some valuable advice uh, along the way. Um, Somebody told me once I, I was hesitating whether I should take a particular job or not, and you know, would pull me away further away from my roots as a faculty member. And somebody said to me, Think of that, think of that new opportunity as walking into a room you've never been in, through a door you've never gone through. There are other doors going out to other places. You don't know where those go. But you can ask yourself, is this a new opportunity that you're going to be able to learn from? You're going to be able to grow as a person and learn new things. And that's the way I've approached everything I do. So I ask myself, am I going to be able to learn? Can I contribute something? Can I learn from it? Can I grow as a person? And those are the, those are the steps I've taken uh, along the way. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, you're connecting the dots is definitely better than what I wrote from my essay. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But but this finally brings us to the um, end of the event. Um, I truly, truly thank you, Dr. Hennessy, for um, for taking your time from a busy schedule and, and joining us here tonight. Um, and thank you to all the viewers who joined us uh, here and and asked you a wonderful question. Uh, I hope it was enjoyable to everyone, including you. Uh, but before we end this event, I really would like to make one humble request, Dr. Hennessy. Um, you know, uh, no pressure to answer or commit at all. Uh, but this event truly allowed um, me and my team to collaborate with people from all around the world, um, especially this year when everything is virtual. 
Uh, it has given amazing opportunity to connect and personally work with people ranging from South Africa to Egypt to India to Nepal. So if you are interested in doing future event with us, we are more than happy to have you back. Perhaps you can even bring some some other people from leadership team at Google. Um, perhaps even Sundar Pichai, if he is if he is willing and uh, have time to join us. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but if you have any ending uh, thoughts, uh, we'd love to hear it. Well, I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the questions from a, a, around the world. I think it's a reminder that uh, we are one big interconnected planet um, and that what happens around the world uh, affects all of us, and we can all learn from different experiences and people who've gone through different walks of life. And I think that's something we need to remember as a, as a human community going forward. So thank you for all the great questions, Rahul, and for moderating this wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, and at last, I would just like to take a brief moment to thank my core team who put together this um, amazing uh, event. I wouldn't have been able to do that without my team. So you can see on the screen their pictures and their name as well. So I truly, truly thank all of you with all my heart. Good night and take care. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Get ready for a cloud-first workplace. Jumpstart your career by signing up for a Google Cloud hands-on learning experience. Companies around the world are moving to the cloud. This is a unique opportunity to gain new skills and professional credentials. If you want to discover a career, scale your startup, or perform groundbreaking research that will change the world, this is the event for you.